The goal of this module is to equip dental professionals with the evidence-based knowledge of toothbrushing and to teach how to effectively and safely perform a toothbrushing procedure. Here are the learning objectives for this module. First, you should be able to describe how toothbrushing works to prevent caries, gingivitis, and periodontitis. Next, you should understand the benefits of using fluoridated dentrifices when toothbrushing. And finally, you should develop the knowledge and skills to teach patients proper toothbrushing technique. We'll start by describing a brief history of toothbrushing. In as early as 5000 BCE, Egyptians used paste to clean their teeth made of various materials including ox hooves and eggshells. The first toothbrushes came later. Archaeological records show that the ancient Babylonians and Egyptians used toothbrushes made of frayed twigs. In 1780, the precursor to the modern toothbrush was invented. This was an instrument with a wooden handle and bristles from pig's hair. These types of brushes, with natural bristles, were used until nylon was invented in 1935. After nylon's invention, the modern nylon bristled toothbrush was invented in 1938. Shortly thereafter, in 1939, the first electric toothbrush was introduced. The dentrificer toothpaste used on the toothbrush is another important aspect of toothbrushing, as we will talk about in this module. Fluoridated toothpaste was first made commercially available in 1956. To learn more about how fluoride works in preventing and reversing initial stages of tooth decay, check out the My Dental Key and Colgate fluoride module. Today, a large variety of toothbrushes exist, ranging from manual brushes to gamified electric toothbrushes. It is estimated that oral diseases, including dental caries and periodontal disease, affect over 3.5 billion people globally. Inadequate exposure to fluoride, growing consumption of sugary foods and drinks, and inadequate access to oral health literacy and oral health care services is causing the burden of oral diseases to increase in many parts of the world. Dental caries is the most prominent disease in the United States, with about 90% of adults greater than 20 years old experiencing caries. Toothbrushing plays a vital role in reducing caries through mechanical debridement of the dental plaque and food debris and fluoride application, thereby preventing caries formation. Toothbrushing also aids in preventing the development of gingivitis, periodontal disease, and halitosis through bacteria, plaque, and food debris removal. When oral bacteria, such as Streptococcus mutans, adhere to the oral biofilm, they ferment dietary carbohydrates into lactic acid, lowering the oral pH. When the oral pH becomes more acidic, the balance shifts from remineralization to demineralization of the tooth surface. Demineralized enamel, an initial or incipient carious lesion, can progress. Once the lesion penetrates to the dentinal layer, the enamel becomes unsupported and the lesion cavitates. Upon cavitation, a lesion can no longer be cleansed properly and the caries must be treated by a dental professional. Thus, brushing serves as a mechanism to reduce caries as it disrupts the oral biofilm. Additionally, Brushing acts as a vehicle to apply and distribute anti-cariogenic agents such as fluoride to the teeth. After brushing, fluoride levels in the saliva and the biofilm increase, which aids in remineralization. In addition to reducing plaque levels, brushing is important in preventing calculus formation. If the plaque remains on the tooth surface, even for as little as four to eight hours, it will calcify forming calculus. Once present, calculus promotes the aggregation of bacteria and food debris, leading to a local host immune response or inflammation of the periodontium. At this stage, patients will need scaling and root planning to debride the tooth surface to resolve the damaging inflammation. If scaling and root planning does not adequately shrink the periodontal pockets, other therapies may be considered. Brushing also serves to prevent the aggregation of bacteria on soft tissue surfaces such as the tongue, which can contribute to halitosis. Toothbrushing involves two main tools, the toothbrush and the dentrifice or toothpaste. Many different types of toothbrushes exist. 
The different types serve different populations and different purposes. Toothbrush bristles are typically made of nylon, though more recently, more sustainable materials such as castor bean oil have entered the market. Brushes may have soft, medium, or hard bristles. To reduce the risk of abrasion and gingival injury, it is recommended that patients always use soft bristled toothbrushes. In some parts of the world, people continue to use sticks or chew sticks called miswoks to clean their teeth. Some patients may find certain handles easier to grasp than others. This aspect of the toothbrush can be especially important for patients with decreased manual dexterity and for caregivers. Handles can also be interchangeable, as is the case with travel toothbrushes. Both pediatric and adult-sized toothbrushes are available. Children's toothbrush products may even have fun incentives for brushing. If your patient states that they have difficulty accessing certain parts of their mouth with their toothbrush, consider recommending a brush with a smaller head. Brushes may be electric or manual. Both types of brushes can be effective at cleaning the teeth when used properly. Many electric toothbrushes are accompanied by apps to track toothbrushing. Toothbrushes are not just for dentate patients. Denture toothbrushes have extremely soft bristles that are typically double-sided. Their softness is key so that they do not abrade the acrylic of the denture. These double-sided toothbrushes can also be useful for patients with limited dexterity as they clean more surfaces at one time. Many types of toothpaste exist. As is true of toothbrushes, toothpaste recommendations should be modified to meet patients' specific needs. In terms of over-the-counter toothpaste, toothpaste with 1,000 or 1,100 parts per million fluoride have been shown to reduce DMFS scores in adults in the permanent dentition in comparison to non-fluoride toothpaste and in primary teeth and in permanent teeth in children and adolescents. The amount of fluoride in toothpaste and the maximum amount of fluoride allowed in toothpaste varies by country but the average amount of fluoride in an over-the-counter toothpaste is 1,000 to 1,500 parts per million. Although non-fluoridated toothpaste exists on the market, the dental profession recommends that children and adults use fluoridated toothpaste. Different toothpastes exist for children and adults. These toothpastes often differ in their flavors, with children's toothpaste having more mild flavors, preferred by children, and their abrasiveness. There are also different toothpastes for sensitive teeth. These toothpastes work in many different ways, such as by occluding the dentinal tubules in order to block nerve stimulation and transmission. Whitening toothpaste also exist. Technically, any toothpaste can be marketed as a whitening toothpaste in that toothpaste help to remove extrinsic staining. Added ingredients for whitening commonly include silica, pyrophosphates, hydrogen peroxide, and carbamide peroxide. Another toothpaste is called GelCam Gel. GelCam is a 0.4% stable stannous fluoride gel used to prevent dental caries and reduce hypersensitivity. This effective decay preventive home use measure should be used as recommended by a dentist or physician. Prescription toothpaste include Prevident Paste. This prescription toothpaste has 5,000 parts per million of fluoride. A prescription toothpaste such as Prevident can be indicated if a patient has high caries risk. Additionally, Prevident Gel can be prescribed. This prescription is similar to Prevident, but it comes in a gel form, which is designed to disperse the fluoride more quickly in the mouth. It is important to note that patients can have allergies or sensitivities to ingredients in toothpaste, such as the foaming agent, sodium lauryl sulfate. If a patient has sloughing of the oral mucosa or another negative reaction, consider consulting with an allergist and instruct the patient to avoid toothpaste with ingredients to which they may have known sensitivities. It is important to consider not only the type of toothpaste, but also the amount of toothpaste indicated for different populations and age groups. For children less than three years old, a smear of toothpaste the size of one grain of rice is adequate. 
For those greater than three years of age, including adults, a pea-sized amount of toothpaste is indicated. Now let's discuss best practices for toothbrushing. Begin toothbrushing with toothpaste as soon as the first tooth arrives in a child's mouth. Children have varying levels of dexterity, so parents should help their kids brush. For infants and young children, parents can brush their teeth using a knee-to-knee -knee position or position themselves behind the kid for better access. Children may be able to adequately brush independently and without supervision when they are capable of washing dishes or tying their shoelaces. Patients should brush their teeth twice daily for at least two minutes to remove a clinically significant amount of plaque, apply fluoride, and reduce halitosis. When should you brush? Oral health professionals recommend patients brush after meals to remove food debris. Patients, especially those with erosion, should not brush for 60 minutes following an acidic meal or drink as both enamel and dentin can be removed directly after acidic exposure. If a patient is only able to brush once per day, it is most important that they brush before sleeping. Saliva plays many important roles in the prevention of dental caries by buffering the pH of the mouth and cleansing the teeth. During sleep, salivary flow is decreased, leading to a reduction in buffering. Brushing mitigates the deleterious effects of plaque accumulation under these more acidic conditions. If patients are going to floss or clean interproximally, which is recommended by dental professionals, Flossing first and then brushing is more effective at removing plaque between the teeth and at maintaining the concentration of fluoride on the tooth enamel, according to a 2018 study in the Journal of Periodontology. Instruct patients to expectorate or spit excess toothpaste during and after brushing. This is especially important for children in order to minimize swallowing of excess fluoride and toothpaste. In order to maximize the amount of time fluoride is in contact with the tooth surface, patients should avoid rinsing as well as eating or drinking after brushing. Eating or drinking beverages other than water can lead to the deposition of carbohydrates on the tooth surface. How should you care for your toothbrush? Toothbrushes should be replaced every three to four months or when the bristles appear worn and frayed, as the effectiveness of toothbrushing will decrease at this point. Toothbrushes should be thoroughly rinsed after every use to remove debris and should be stored in a dry environment in order to prevent microbial growth. Toothbrushes should not be shared between people in order to prevent the spread of bacteria. Monitor the expiration date of your toothpaste as if the toothpaste had passed its dated shelf life, it may have reduced benefits following the breakdown of fluoride and other active ingredients. The average lifespan of a tube of toothpaste is about two years. Now let's discuss step-by-step step how patients should properly brush their teeth. There are different brushing techniques. In general, oral health professionals recommend that patients use the modified BAS technique. When compared with other brushing techniques, the modified BAS technique has been shown to remove significantly more super gingival plaque than other brushing techniques. Regardless of the brushing technique used, it is essential to teach patients to brush all surfaces of their teeth, facial and buccal, lingual, occlusal, and incisal. Brushing in a systematic pattern, for example, maxillary, then mandibular, moving from posterior to anterior, buccal to lingual, can help patients remember to reproducibly brush all surfaces of their teeth. In this video, we will demonstrate the manual modified bass brushing technique. First, place the appropriate amount of toothpaste on the brush. To position the brush, place it at a 45 degree angle to the tooth surface with the bristle tips angled into the gingival crevice. Beginning with the most posterior tooth on the buccal surface, gently move the brush back and forth. The brush stroke should be small and circular in character. When the toothbrush is angled into the gingival crevice, brush in place for about four strokes and then move the brush more anteriorly. Repeat until all of the facial and buccal surfaces have been cleaned. First maxillary teeth, then mandibular teeth. Next, use the same technique to clean the lingual surfaces of the teeth, again maxillary, then mandibular, 
The brush should be positioned so that the bristles are in contact with the lingual gingival sulcus and the occlusal or incisal edge of the teeth. Finally, clean the incisal and occlusal surfaces of all teeth, again moving from the posterior to the anterior and from maxillary to mandibular teeth. After brushing all surfaces of the teeth, patients should gently brush their tongue by angling the bristles of the brush toward the tongue dorsum to remove buildup. Instruct patients to expectorate excess toothpaste and to refrain from rinsing the mouth after brushing. Now let's discuss how to use an electric toothbrush with the modified bass technique. The main difference between the modified bass technique for electric and manual brushes is that when using an electric brush, patients do not need to move the brush back and forth. Rather, the brush should remain in one location for a few seconds, and then the brush should be moved to a more anterior location. As with the manual toothbrush, apply light pressure to prevent abrasion of the tooth surface. You can advise patients that if their toothbrush bristles are quickly becoming damaged or frayed, then they may be brushing too hard. If patients opt for an electric toothbrush and they show signs of abrasion, it may be helpful if they choose a brush that alerts them if they are applying too much pressure. Now let's talk about how to motivate your patients to brush their teeth at home. As with any healthy behavior, the first step is to make toothbrushing a habit for patients. For example, in pediatric patients, incentivizing brushing with non-sugary rewards such as stickers can be a strong motivator for improved and increasing brushing behaviors. Colorful toothpaste and toothbrushes and fun designs on these brushes can also be useful in encouraging children to brush their teeth. Disclosing solutions can help illustrate the amount of plaque on patients' teeth that's left over. These solutions can be a helpful tool for motivating patients to improve their oral hygiene behaviors. For many patients, the use of an electric toothbrush leads to improved brushing behaviors. Today, many applications exist that can track brushing, including informing patients in real time where they have brushed and how much pressure they are applying during brushing, and if their angulation of the toothbrush is appropriate. Follow up with the patient at future dental visits and ask them how their brushing at home is going, ask about any challenges and rewards, reassess brushing technique and thoroughness by having the patient demonstrate their brushing skill, and modify the recommendations as needed. Here are a few key points about toothbrushing. Mechanically removing plaque and food debris and distributing fluoride to the dentition through toothbrushing helps to prevent caries, calculus formation, gingivitis, periodontitis, and halitosis. Toothbrushing should be performed twice a day for at least two minutes each time using the appropriate toothbrushing technique, the modified bass technique, it is important to select the appropriate fluoridated toothpaste and toothbrushes for patients to best serve their individual needs. Regular toothbrushing is not a replacement for regular dental cleanings and checkups with a dental professional. Thank you for watching this My Dental Key and Colgate module on toothbrushing. Be sure to check out our other modules on fluoride application and flossing.